Trajan, Latin, Imperator Caesar Nerva Traianus Divi Nervae Filius Augustus, the 18th of September 53 to the 8th of August 117 AD, was Roman emperor from 98 to 117 AD. Officially declared by the Senate Optimus Princeps, the best ruler. Trajan is remembered as a successful soldier emperor who presided over the greatest military expansion in Roman history, leading the empire to attain its maximum territorial extent by the time of his death. He is also known for his philanthropic rule, overseeing extensive public building programs and implementing social welfare policies, which earned him his enduring reputation as the second of the five good emperors who presided over an era of peace and prosperity in the Mediterranean world. Trajan was born in the city of Italica close to modern Sevilla, an Italian settlement in the province of Hispania Baetica. Altuf misleadingly designated by some later writers as a provincial, his family came from Umbria and he was born a Roman citizen. Trajan rose to prominence during the reign of Emperor Domitian. Serving as a legatus legionis in Hispania Terraconensis, in 89 Trajan supported Domitian against a revolt on the Rhine led by Antonius Saturninus. In September 96, Domitian was succeeded by Marcus Cocius Nerva, an old and childless senator who proved to be unpopular with the army. After a brief and tumultuous year in power, culminating in a revolt by members of the Praetorian Guard, Nerva was compelled to adopt the more popular Trajan as his heir and successor. He died on 27 January 98 and was succeeded by his adopted son without incident. As a civilian administrator, Trajan is best known for his extensive public building program, which reshaped the city of Rome and left numerous enduring landmarks such as Trajan's Forum, Trajan's Market and Trajan's Column. Early in his reign, he annexed the Nabataean Kingdom, creating the province of Arabia Petraea. His conquest of Dacia enriched the empire greatly, as the new province possessed many valuable gold mines. Trajan war against the Parthian Empire ended with the sack of the capital Cte Siphon and the annexation of Armenia and Mesopotamia. His campaigns expanded the Roman Empire to its greatest territorial extent. In late 117, while sailing back to Rome, Trajan fell ill and died of a stroke in the city of Salinas. He was deified by the Senate and his ashes were laid to rest under Trajan's column. He was succeeded by his adopted son Hadrian. Sources As an emperor, Trajan's reputation has endured, he is one of the few rulers whose reputation has survived 19 centuries. Every new emperor after him was honored by the Senate with the wish Felicior Augusto, Melior Traiano that he be luckier than Augustus and better than Trajan. Among medieval Christian theologians, Trajan was considered a virtuous pagan. In the Renaissance, Machiavelli, speaking on the advantages of adoptive succession over heredity, mentioned the five successive good emperors from Nerva to Marcus, a trope out of which the 18th-century historian Edward Gibbon popularized the notion of the five good emperors, of whom Trajan was the second. As far as ancient literary sources are concerned, an extant continuous account of Trajan's reign does not exist. An account of the Dacian Wars, the Commentary de Bellis Dacices, written by Trajan himself or a ghostwriter and modelled after Caesar's Commentary de Bello Gallico, is lost with the exception of one sentence. Only fragments remain of the Getica, a book by Trajan's personal physician Tito's Statilios Christian. The Parthica, a 17-volume account of the Parthian Wars written by Arian, has met a similar fate. Book 68 in Cassius Dio. Roman history, which survives mostly as Byzantine abridgments and epitomies, is the main source for the political history of Trajan's rule. Besides this, Pliny the Younger's Panegyricus and Dio of Prusa's orations are the best surviving contemporary sources. Both are adulatory perorations, typical of the late Roman era, that describe an idealized monarch and an equally idealized view of Trajan rule, and concern themselves more with ideology than with actual fact. The tenth volume of Pliny's letters contains his correspondence with Trajan, which deals with various aspects of imperial Roman government, but this correspondence is neither intimate nor candid, it is an exchange of official mail, in which Pliny's stance borders on the servile. 
it is certain that much of the text of the letters that appear in this collection over Trajan S signature was written and or edited by Trajan's imperial secretary, his ab epistulus. Therefore, discussion of Trajan and his rule in modern historiography cannot avoid speculation, as well as recourse to non-literary sources such as archaeology and epigraphy. <laughs> Early life and rise to power Marcus Ulpus Traianus was born on 18 September 53 AD in the Roman province of Hispania Baetica in what is now Andalusia in modern Spain, in the city of Italica now in the municipal area of Santiponce, in the outskirts of Seville. Although frequently designated the first provincial emperor, and dismissed by later writers such as Cassius Dio himself of provincial origin as an Iberian, and neither an Italian nor even an Italiate, Trajan appears to have hailed on his father side from the area of Tudor modern Todi in Umbria, at the border with Etruria, and on his mother's side from the Gens Martia, of an Italic family of Sabine origin. Trajan's birthplace of Italica was founded as a Roman military colony of Italian settlers in 206 BC, though it is unknown when the Ulpii arrived there. It is possible, but cannot be substantiated, that Trajan S ancestors married local women and lost their citizenship at some point, but they certainly recovered their status when the city became a municipium with Latin citizenship in the mid first century BC. Trajan was the son of Marcia, a Roman noblewoman and sister-in-law of the second Flavian emperor Titus, and Marcus Ulpus Traianus, a prominent senator and general from the Gens Ulpa. Marcus Ulpus Traianus the Elder served Vespasian in the First Jewish-Roman War, commanding the Legio X Fratensis. Trajan himself was just one of many well-known Ulpii in a line that continued long after his own death. His elder sister was Ulpa Marciana, and his niece was Salonina Matidia. The patria of the Ulpii was Italica, in Spanish Baetica, where their ancestors had settled late in the 3rd century BC. As a young man, he rose through the ranks of the Roman army, serving in some of the most contested parts of the empire's frontier. In 76–77, Trajan. S. Father was governor of Syria, Legatus pro Praetor Syriae, where Trajan himself remained as Tribunus Legionis. From there, after his father's replacement, he seems to have been transferred to an unspecified Rhine province, and Pliny implies that he engaged in active combat duty during both commissions. In about 86, Trajan's cousin P. Aelius Offer died, leaving his young children Hadrian and Paulina orphans. Trajan and a colleague of his, Publius Acilius Atianus, became co guardians of the two children. In 91, Trajan was created ordinary consul for the year, which was a great honor as he was in his late 30s and therefore just above the minimum legal age 32 for holding the post. This can be explained in part by the prominence of his father's career, as his father had been instrumental to the ascent of the ruling Flavian dynasty, held consular rank himself, and had just been made a patrician. Around this time Trajan brought Apollodorus of Damascus with him to Rome, and also married Pompeia Platina, a noble woman from the Roman settlement at Nimes. The marriage ultimately remained childless. It has been remarked by later authors among them Trajan's late successor Julian that Trajan was personally inclined towards homosexuality, far in excess of the usual bisexual activity that was common among upper-class Roman men of the period. Although Julian S. scathing comments on the matter reflect a change of mores that began with the Severan dynasty. An earlier author, Cassius Dio, already makes reference to Trajan's marked personal preference for the male sex. Trajan's putative lovers included Hadrian, pages of the imperial household, the actor Pilates, a dancer called Apuleius, Lucius Licinius Sura, and Nerva, as the details of Trajan. S military career are obscure. It is only sure that in 89, as legate of Legio VII Gemina in Hispania Terraconensis, he supported Domitian against an attempted coup. Later, after his 91 consulate held with Acilius Glabrio, a rare pair of consuls at the time, in that neither consul was a member of the ruling dynasty, he held some unspecified consular commission as governor on either Pannonia or Germania Superior, possibly both. 
Pliny, who seems to deliberately avoid offering details that would stress personal attachment between Trajan and the tyrant Domitian, attributes to him, at the time, various and unspecified feats of arms, since Domitian's successor, Nerva, was unpopular with the army and had just been forced by his praetorian prefect Casperius Aelianus to execute Domitian's killers, he felt the need to gain the support of the military in order to avoid being ousted. He accomplished this in the summer of 97 by naming Trajan as his adoptive son and successor, allegedly solely on Trajan's outstanding military merits. There are hints, however, in contemporary literary sources that Trajan's adoption was imposed on Nerva. Pliny implied as much when he wrote that, although an emperor could not be coerced into doing something, if this were the way in which Trajan was raised to power, then it was worth it. If this was what actually occurred, Trajan would be a usurper, and the notion of a natural continuity between Nerva's and Trajan's reigns would be an ex post fiction developed later by historians such as Tacitus. According to the Augustan history, it was the future emperor Hadrian who brought word to Trajan of his adoption. Hadrian was then retained on the Rhine frontier by Trajan as a military tribune, becoming privy to the circle of friends and relations with which Trajan surrounded himself, among them the then governor of Germania Inferior, the Spaniard Lucius Licinius Sura, who became Trajan's chief personal advisor and official friend. As a token of his influence, Sura would later become consul for the third time in 107. Some ancient sources also tell about his having built a bath named after him on the Aventine Hill in Rome, or having this bath built by Trajan and then named after him, in either case a signal of honor is the only exception to the established rule that a public building in the capital could be dedicated only to a member of the imperial family. These baths were later expanded by the 3rd century emperor Decius as a means of stressing his link to Trajan. Sura is also described as telling Hadrian in 108 about his selection as imperial heir. According to a modern historian, Sura's role as kingmaker and eminence grise was deeply resented by some senators, especially the historian Tacitus, who acknowledged Sura's military and oratory virtues but at the same time resented his rapacity and devious ways, similar to those of Vespasian's eminence grise Licinius Mucianus, as governor of Lower Germany during Nerva. S. Reign, Trajan received the impressive title of Germanicus for his skillful management and rule of the volatile imperial province. When Nerva died on 27 January 98, Trajan succeeded to the role of emperor without any outward incident. However, the fact that he chose not to hasten towards Rome, but instead to make a lengthy tour of inspection on the Rhine and Danube frontiers, hints to the possible fact that his power position in Rome was unsure and that he had first to assure himself of the loyalty of the armies at the front. It is noteworthy that Trajan ordered prefect Aelianus to attend him in Germany, where he was apparently executed, put out of the way, with his post being taken by Attius Suburinus. Trajan's accession, therefore, could qualify more as a successful coup than an orderly succession. <laughs> Roman Emperor on his entry to Rome, Trajan granted the plebs a direct gift of money. The traditional donative to the troops, however, was reduced by half. There remained the issue of the strained relations between the emperor and the senate, especially after the supposed bloodiness that had marked Domitian's reign and his dealings with the Curia. By feigning reluctance to hold power, Trajan was able to start building a consensus around him in the senate. His belated ceremonial entry into Rome in 99 was notably understated, something on which Pliny the Younger elaborated, by not openly supporting Domitian's preference for equestrian officers, Trajan appeared to conform to the idea developed by Pliny that an emperor derived his legitimacy from his adherence to traditional hierarchies and senatorial morals. Therefore, he could point to the allegedly republican character of his rule. In a speech at the inauguration of his third consulship, on 1 January 100, Trajan exhorted the Senate to share the care-taking of the empire with him, an event later celebrated on a coin. In reality, Trajan did not share power in any meaningful way with the Senate, something that Pliny admits candidly. E. Verything depends on the whims of a single man who, on behalf of the common welfare, has taken upon himself all functions and all tasks. 
One of the most significant trends of his reign was his encroachment on the Senate's sphere of authority, such as his decision to make the senatorial provinces of Achaia and Bithynia into imperial ones in order to deal with the inordinate spending on public works by local magnates and the general mismanagement of provincial affairs by various proconsuls appointed by the Senate. In the formula developed by Pliny, however, Trajan was a good emperor in that, by himself, he approved or blamed the same things that the Senate would have approved or blamed. If in reality Trajan was an autocrat, his deferential behavior towards his peers qualified him to be viewed as a virtuous monarch. The whole idea was that Trajan wielded autocratic power through moderatio instead of contumacia, moderation instead of insolence. In short, according to the ethics for autocracy developed by most political writers of the Imperial Roman Age, Trajan was a good ruler in that he ruled less by fear, and more by acting as a role model, for, according to Pliny, Men learn better from examples. Eventually, Trajan's popularity among his peers was such that the Roman Senate bestowed upon him the honorific of Optimus, meaning the best, which appears on coins from 105 on. This title had mostly to do with Trajan's role as benefactor, such as in the case of him returning confiscated property, that Trajan's ideal role was a conservative one becomes evident from Pliny. S works as well as from the orations of Dio of Prusa, in particular his four orations on kingship, composed early during Trajan's reign. Dio, as a Greek notable and intellectual with friends in high places, and possibly an official friend to the emperor Amicus Caesaris, saw Trajan as a defender of the status quo. In his third kingship oration, Dio describes an ideal king ruling by means of friendship that is, through patronage and a network of local notables who act as mediators between the ruled and the ruler. Dio's notion of being friend to Trajan or any other Roman emperor, however, was that of an informal arrangement, that involved no formal entry of such friends into the Roman administration, exactly what was to put Greek-speaking elites and Trajan on a collision course. The correctors, Greek-Roman relations As a senatorial emperor, Trajan was inclined to choose his local base of political support from among the members of the ruling urban oligarchies. In the West, that meant local senatorial families like his own. In the East, that meant the families of Greek notables. The Greeks, though, had their own memories of independence, and a commonly acknowledged sense of cultural superiority, and, instead of seeing themselves as Roman, disdained Roman rule. What the Greek oligarchies wanted from Rome was, above all, to be left in peace, to be allowed to exert their right to self-government i.e., to be excluded from the provincial government, as was Italy and to concentrate on their local interests. This was something the Romans were not disposed to do as from their perspective the Greek notables were shunning their responsibilities in regard to the management of imperial affairs, primarily in failing to keep the common people under control, thus creating the need for the Roman governor to intervene. An excellent example of this Greek alienation was the personal role played by Dio of Prusa in his relationship with Trajan. Dio is described by Philostratus as Trajan close friend, and Trajan is supposedly engaging publicly in conversations with Dio. Nevertheless, as a Greek local magnate with a taste for costly building projects and pretensions of being an important political agent for Rome, Dio of Prusa was actually a target for one of Trajan's authoritarian innovations, the appointing of imperial correctors to audit the civic finances of the technically free Greek cities. The main goal was to curb the overenthusiastic spending on public works that served to channel ancient rivalries between neighboring cities. As Pliny wrote to Trajan, this had as its most visible consequence a trail of unfinished or ill-kept public utilities. Competition among Greek cities and their ruling oligarchies was mainly for marks of preeminence, especially for titles bestowed by the Roman emperor. Such titles were ordered in a ranking system that determined how the cities were to be outwardly treated by Rome. The usual form that such rivalries took was that of grandiose building plans, giving the cities the opportunity to vie with each other over extravagant, needless structures that would make a show. 
A side effect of such extravagant spending was that junior and thus less wealthy members of the local oligarchies felt disinclined to present themselves to fill posts as local magistrates, positions that involved ever increasing personal expense. Roman authorities liked to play the Greek cities against one another, something of which Dio of Prusa was fully aware. B. Why their public acts the Roman governors have branded you as a pack of fools, yes, they treat you just like children, for we often offer children the most trivial things in place of things of greatest worth in place of justice, in place of the freedom of the cities from spoliation or from the seizure of the private possessions of their inhabitants, in place of their refraining from insulting you your governors hand you titles, and call you first either by word of mouth or in writing, that done, they may thenceforth with impunity treat you as being the very last. These same Roman authorities had also an interest in assuring the city's solvency and therefore ready collection of imperial taxes. Last but not least, inordinate spending on civic buildings was not only a means to achieve local superiority, but also a means for the local Greek elites to maintain a separate cultural identity, something expressed in the contemporary rise of the Second Sophistic. This cultural patriotism acted as a kind of substitute for the loss of political independence, and as such was shunned by Roman authorities. As Trajan himself wrote to Pliny, these poor Greeks all love a gymnasium. They will have to content with one that suits their real needs. The first known corrector was charged with a commission to deal with the situation of the free cities, as it was felt that the old method of ad hoc intervention by the emperor and or the proconsuls had not been enough to curb the pretensions of the Greek notables. It is noteworthy that an embassy from Dio's city of Prusa was not favorably received by Trajan, and that this had to do with Dio's chief objective, which was to elevate Prusa to the status of a free city, an independent city-state exempt from paying taxes to Rome. Eventually, Dio gained for Prusa the right to become the head of the Assize district, conventus meaning that Prusans did not have to travel to be judged by the Roman governor, but a lutheria freedom, in the sense of full political autonomy was denied. Eventually, it fell to Pliny, as imperial governor of Bithynia in 110 AD, to deal with the consequences of the financial mess wrought by Dio and his fellow civic officials. It's well established that the city's finances are in a state of disorder. Pliny once wrote to Trajan, plans for unnecessary works made in collusion with local contractors being identified as one of the main problems. One of the compensatory measures proposed by Pliny expressed a thoroughly Roman conservative position, as the city's financial solvency depended on the councilmen's purses, it was necessary to have more councilmen on the local city councils. According to Pliny, the best way to achieve this was to lower the minimum age for holding a seat on the council, making it possible for more sons of the established oligarchical families to join and thus contribute to civic spending. This was seen as preferable to enrolling non noble wealthy upstarts. Such an increase in the number of council members was granted to Dio's city of Prusa, to the dismay of existing councilmen who felt their status lowered. A similar situation existed in Claudiopolis, where a public bath was built with the proceeds from the entrance fees paid by supernumerary members of the council, enrolled with Trajan's permission. Also, according to the Digest, it was decreed by Trajan that when a city magistrate promised to achieve a particular public building, it was incumbent on his heirs to complete the building. Trajan ingratiated himself with the Greek intellectual elite by recalling to Rome many, including Dio, who had been exiled by Domitian, and by returning, in a process begun by Nerva, a great deal of private property that Domitian had confiscated. He also had good dealings with Plutarch, who, as a notable of Delphi, seems to have been favoured by the decisions taken on behalf of his home place by one of Trajan's legates, who had arbitrated a boundary dispute between Delphi and its neighbouring cities. However, it was clear to Trajan that Greek intellectuals and notables were to be regarded as tools for local administration, and not be allowed to fancy themselves in a privileged position. As Pliny said in one of his letters at the time, it was official policy that Greek civic elites be treated according to their status as notionally free but not put on an equal footing with their Roman rulers. When the city of Apamea complained of an audit of its accounts by Pliny, alleging its free status as a Roman colony, Trajan replied by writing that it was by his own wish that such inspections had been ordered. 
Concern about independent local political activity is seen in Trajan's decision to forbid Nicomedia from having a corps of firemen. If people assemble for a common purpose, they soon turn it into a political society. Trajan wrote to Pliny, as well as in his and Pliny's fears about excessive civic generosities by local notables, such as distribution of money or gifts. For the same reason, judging from Pliny. S letters it can also be assumed that Trajan and his aides were as much bored as they were alarmed by the claims of Dio and other Greek notables to political influence based on what they saw as their special connection to their Roman overlords. A revealing case history, told by Pliny, tells of Dio of Prusa placing a statue of Trajan in a building complex where Dio's wife and son were buried, therefore incurring a charge of treason for placing the emperor's statue near a grave. Trajan, however, dropped the charge. Nevertheless, while the office of corrector was intended as a tool to curb any hint of independent political activity among local notables in the Greek cities, the correctors themselves were all men of the highest social standing entrusted with an exceptional commission. The post seems to have been conceived partly as a reward for senators who had chosen to make a career solely on the emperor's behalf. Therefore, in reality the post was conceived as a means for taming both Greek notables and Roman senators. It must be added that, although Trajan was wary of the civic oligarchies in the Greek cities, he also admitted into the Senate a number of prominent Eastern notables already slated for promotion during Domitian's reign by reserving for them one of the twenty posts open each year for minor magistrates the Such must be the case of the Galatian notable and leading member of the Greek community", according to one inscription Gaius Julius Severus, who was a descendant of several Hellenistic dynasts and client kings. Severus was the grandfather of the prominent general Gaius Julius Quadratus Bassus, consul in 105. Other prominent Eastern senators included Gaius Julius Alexander Berenicianus, a descendant of Herod the Great, suffect consul in 116. Trajan created at least 14 new senators from the Greek-speaking half of the empire, an unprecedented recruitment number that opens to question the issue of the «traditionally Roman» character of his reign, as well as the «Hellenism» of his successor Hadrian. But then Trajan S. New Eastern senators were mostly very powerful and very wealthy men with more than local influence and much interconnected by marriage, so that many of them were not altogether new to the Senate. On the local level, among the lower section of the Eastern property, the alienation of most Greek notables and intellectuals towards Roman rule, and the fact that the Romans were seen by most such Greek notables as aliens, persisted well after Trajan's reign. One of Trajan's senatorial creations from the East, the Athenian Gaius Julius Antiochus Epiphanes Philippapos, a member of the royal house of Commagene, left behind him a funeral monument on the Mausian Hill that was later disparagingly described by Pausanias as, "...a monument built to a Syrian man". <laughs> Conquest of Dacia it was as a military commander that Trajan is best known to history, particularly for his conquests in the Near East, but initially for the two wars against Dacia, the reduction to client kingdom 101 followed by actual incorporation into the empire of the Trans-Danube border group of Dacia, an area that had troubled Roman thought for over a decade with the unstable peace negotiated by Domitian's ministers with the powerful Dacian king Decebalus. According to the provisions of this treaty, Decebalus was acknowledged as rex amicus, that is, client king. Nevertheless, in exchange for accepting client status, he received a generous stipend from Rome, as well as being supplied with technical experts. The treaty seems to have allowed Roman troops the right of passage through the Dacian kingdom in order to attack the Marcomanni, Quadi, and Sarmatians. However, senatorial opinion never forgave Domitian for paying what was seen as tribute to a barbarian king. In addition, unlike the Germanic tribes, the Dacian kingdom was an organized state capable of developing alliances of its own, thus making it a strategic threat and giving Trajan a strong motive to attack it. In May of 101, Trajan launched his first campaign into the Dacian kingdom, crossing to the northern bank of the Danube and defeating the Dacian army at Tapai, near the Iron Gates of Transylvania. 
It was not a decisive victory, however. Trajan S troops were mauled in the encounter and he put off further campaigning for the year in order to regroup and reinforce his army. The following winter, King Decebalus took the initiative by launching a counterattack across the Danube further downstream, supported by Sarmatian cavalry, forcing Trajan to come to the aid of the troops in his rearguard. The Dacians and their allies were repulsed after two battles in Mosia at Nicopolis ad Istrum and Adamclesi. Trajan's army then advanced further into Dacian territory, and, a year later, forced Decebalus to submit. He had to renounce claim to some regions of his kingdom, return all Roman runaways, most of them technical experts, and surrender all his war machines. Trajan returned to Rome in triumph and was granted the title Dacicus. The Peace of 102 had returned Decebalus to the condition of more or less harmless client king, however, he soon began to rearm, to again harbor Roman runaways, and to pressure his western neighbors, the Iazigas Sarmatians, into allying themselves with him. By trying to develop an anti-Roman bloc, Decebalus eventually left Trajan without the alternative of treating Dacia as a protectorate, rather than an outright conquest. In 104 Decebalus devised a failed attempt on Trajan's life by means of some Roman deserters, and held prisoner Trajan's legate Longinus, who eventually poisoned himself while in custody. Finally, in 105, Decebalus undertook an invasion of Roman occupied territory north of the Danube. Prior to the campaign, Trajan had raised two entirely new legions, two Traiana, which, however, may have been posted in the east, at the Syrian port of Laodicea, and XXX Ulpa Victrix, which was posted to Brigatio, in Pannonia. By 105, the concentration of Roman troops assembled in the Middle and Lower Danube amounted to 14 legions up from 9 in 101 about half of the entire Roman army. Even after the Dacian Wars, the Danube frontier would permanently replace the Rhine as the main military axis of the Roman Empire. Including auxiliaries, the number of Roman troops engaged on both campaigns was between 150,000 and 175,000, while Decebalus could dispose of up to 200,000. Following the design of Apollodorus of Damascus, Trajan ordered the building of a massive bridge over the Danube, over which the Roman army was able to cross the river swiftly and in numbers, as well as to send in reinforcements, even in winter when the river was not frozen enough to bear the passage of a party of soldiers. Trajan also reformed the infrastructure of the Iron Gates region of the Danube. He commissioned either the creation or enlargement of the road along the Iron Gates, carved into the side of the gorge. Additionally, Trajan commissioned a canal to be built around the rapids of the Iron Gates. Evidence of this comes from a marble slab discovered near Caput Bovis, the site of a Roman fort. The slab, dated to the year 101, commemorates the building of at least one canal that went from the Cassina tributary to at least Ducas Pratum, whose embankments were still visible until recently. However, the placement of the slab at Caput Bovis suggests that the canal extended to this point or that there was a second canal downriver of the Cassina Ducas Pratum one. These costly projects completed, in 105 Trajan again took to the field. In a fierce campaign which seems to have consisted mostly of static warfare, the Dacians, devoid of maneuvering room, kept to their network of fortresses, which the Romans sought systematically to storm see also Second Dacian War. The Romans gradually tightened their grip around Decebalus' stronghold in Sarmizgetusa Regia, which they finally took and destroyed. Decebalus fled, but, when cornered by Roman cavalry, committed suicide. His severed head, brought to Trajan by the cavalryman Tiberius Claudius Maximus, was later exhibited in Rome on the steps leading up to the capital and thrown on the Gemonian stairs. Trajan built a new city, Colonia Ulpa Traiana Augusta Dacica Sarmizgetusa, on another site north of the hill citadel holding the previous Dacian capital, although bearing the same full name, Sarmizgetusa. This capital city was conceived as a purely civilian administrative center and was provided the usual Romanized administrative apparatus decurions, aediles, etc. Urban life in Roman Dacia seems to have been restricted to Roman colonists, mostly military veterans. There is no extant evidence for the existence in the province of peregrine cities. Native Dacians continued to live in scattered rural settlements, according to their own ways. In another arrangement with no parallels in any other Roman province, the existing quasi-urban Dacian settlements disappeared after the Roman conquest. A number of unorganized urban settlements developed around military encampments in Dacia proper, the most important being Apulum, but were only acknowledged as cities proper well after Trajan 
S. Rain, the main regional effort of urbanization was concentrated by Trajan at the rearguard, in Mosia, where he created the new cities of Nicopolis ad Istrum and Marcianopolis. A vicus was also created around the Tropium Traianum. The garrison city of Escus received the status of Roman colony after its legionary garrison was redeployed. The fact that these former Danubian outposts had ceased to be frontier bases and were now in the deep rear acted as an inducement to their urbanization and development, not all of Dacia was permanently occupied. What was permanently included in the province, after the post-Trajanic evacuation of some land across the lower Danube, were the lands extending from the Danube to the inner arch of the Carpathian Mountains, including Transylvania, the Metallifery Mountains and Oltenia. The Roman province eventually took the form of an excrescence north of the Danube, with ill-defined limits, stretching from the Danube northwards to the Carpathians, and was intended perhaps as a basis for further expansion in Eastern Europe, which the Romans conceived to be much more flattened, and closer to the ocean, than it actually was. Defence of the province was entrusted to a single legion, the Thirteen Gemina, stationed at Apulum, which functioned as an advanced guard that could, in case of need, strike either west or east at the Sarmatians living at the borders. Therefore, the indefensible character of the province did not appear to be a problem for Trajan, as the province was conceived more as a sally base for further attacks. Even in the absence of further Roman expansion, the value of the province depended on Roman overall strength. While Rome was strong, the Dacian salient was an instrument of military and diplomatic control over the Danubian lands. When Rome was weak, as during the crisis of the 3rd century, the province became a liability and was eventually abandoned. Trajan resettled Dacia with Romans and annexed it as a province of the Roman Empire. Aside from their enormous booty over half a million slaves, according to John Lydus, Trajan's Dacian campaigns benefited the empire's finances through the acquisition of Dacia's gold mines, managed by an imperial procurator of equestrian rank procurator Aurariarum. On the other hand, commercial agricultural exploitation on the villa model, based on the centralized management of a huge landed estate by a single owner fundus was poorly developed. Therefore, use of slave labor in the province itself seems to have been relatively undeveloped, and epigraphic evidence points to work in the gold mines being conducted by means of labor contracts locatio conductio rei and seasonal wage earning. The victory was commemorated by the construction both of the 102 cenotaph generally known as the Tropium Trajani in Mosia, as well of the much later 113 Trajan's column in Rome, the latter depicting in stone carved ba reliefs the Dacian Wars. Most important moments. Topic: <inaudible> Annexation of Nabataea. Topic: In 106, Rabel II Soter, one of Rome's client kings, died. This event might have prompted the annexation of the Nabataean kingdom, but the manner and the formal reasons for the annexation are unclear. Some epigraphic evidence suggests a military operation with forces from Syria and Egypt. What is known is that by 107, Roman legions were stationed in the area around Petra and Bostra, as is shown by a papyrus found in Egypt. The furthest south the Romans occupied or, better, garrisoned, adopting a policy of having garrisons at key points in the desert was Hegra, over 300 kilometres southwest of Petra. The empire gained what became the province of Arabia Petraea modern southern Jordan and northwest Saudi Arabia. As Nabataea was the last client kingdom in Asia west of the Euphrates, the annexation meant that the entire Roman East had been provincialized, completing a trend towards direct rule that had begun under the Flavians. <laughs> Period of peace, public buildings and festivities For the next seven years, Trajan ruled as a civilian emperor, to the same acclaim as before. It was during this time that he corresponded with Pliny the Younger on the subject of how to deal with the Christians of Pontus, telling Pliny to continue to persecute Christians but not to accept anonymous denunciations in the interests of justice as well as of the spirit of the age. People who admitted to their being Christians and refused to recant, however, were to be executed for obstinacy, 
When non citizens, and sent to Rome for trial if they were Roman citizens, Trajan built several new buildings, monuments, and roads in Italia and his native Hispania. His magnificent complex in Rome raised to commemorate his victories in Dacia and largely financed from that campaign's loot consisting of a forum, Trajan's column, and Trajan's market, still stands in Rome today. He was also a prolific builder of triumphal arches, many of which survive, and a rebuilder of roads via Traiana and via Traiana Nova. One of Trajan's notable acts during this period was the hosting of a three-month gladiatorial festival in the Great Colosseum in Rome the precise date is unknown. Combining chariot racing, beast fights and close quarters gladiatorial bloodshed, this gory spectacle reputedly left 11,000 dead mostly slaves and criminals, not to mention the thousands of ferocious beasts killed alongside them and attracted a total of 5 million spectators over the course of the festival. The care bestowed by Trajan on the managing of such public spectacles led the orator Fronto to state approvingly that Trajan had paid equal attention to entertainments as well as to serious issues. Fronto concluded that, "...neglect of serious matters can cause greater damage, but neglect of amusements greater discontent." As Fronto added, amusements were a means to assure the general acquiescence of the populace, while the more "...serious," issue of the corn dole aimed ultimately only at individuals. Devaluation of the currency In 107 Trajan devalued the Roman currency. He decreased the silver purity of the denarius from 93.5% to 89% the actual silver weight dropping from 3.04 g to 2.88 g. This devaluation, coupled with the massive amount of gold and silver carried off after Trajan. S. Dacian Wars, allowed the emperor to mint a larger quantity of denarii than his predecessors. Also, Trajan withdrew from circulation silver denarii minted before the previous devaluation achieved by Nero, something that allows for thinking that Trajan's devaluation had to do with political ends, such as allowing for increased civil and military spending. The Alimenta Another important act was his formalization of the Alimenta, a welfare program that helped orphans and poor children throughout Italy. It provided general funds, as well as food and subsidized education. The program was supported initially out of Dacian War booty, and then later by a combination of estate taxes and philanthropy. In general terms, the scheme functioned by means of mortgages on Italian farms fundi, through which registered landowners received a lump sum from the imperial treasure, being in return expected to pay yearly a given proportion of the loan to the maintenance of an alimentary fund. Although the system is well documented in literary sources and contemporary epigraphy, its precise aims are controversial and have generated considerable dispute among modern scholars, especially about its actual aims and scope as a piece of welfare policy. It is usually assumed that the program was intended to bolster citizen numbers in Italy, following the provisions of Augustus' moral legislation Lex Julia favoring procreation on moral grounds, something openly acknowledged by Pliny. Nevertheless, this reproductive aim was anachronistic, based as it was on a view of the Roman Empire as centered on Rome and Italy, with a purely Italian manpower base, both increasingly no longer the case. This outdated stance was confirmed by Pliny when he wrote that the recipients of the Alimenta were supposed to people the barracks and the tribes as future soldiers and electors, two roles ill-fitted to the contemporary reality of an empire stretching across the entire Mediterranean and ruled by an autocrat. The fact that the scheme was restricted to Italy suggests that it might have been conceived as a form of political privilege accorded to the original heartland of the empire. According to the French historian Paul Petit, the Alimenta should be seen as part of a set of measures aimed towards the economic recovery of Italy. Finlay thinks that the scheme's chief aim was the artificial bolstering of the political weight of Italy, as seen, for example, in the stricture, heartily praised by Pliny, laid down by Trajan that ordered all senators, even when from the provinces, to have at least a third of their landed estates in Italian territory, as it was unseemly that they should treat Rome and Italy not as their native land, but as a mere inn or lodging house. Interesting and unique, as the scheme was, it remains small. 
The fact that it was subsidized by means of interest payments on loans made by landowners, mostly large ones, assumed to be more reliable debtors, actually benefited a very low percentage of potential welfare recipients Paul Vane has assumed that, in the city of Velaya, only one child out of ten was an actual beneficiary thus the idea, put forth by Moses I. Finley, that the grandiose aims amounted to at most a form of random charity, an additional imperial benevolence. Reliance solely on loans to great landowners in Velaya, only some 17 square kilometers were mortgaged restricted funding sources even further. It seems that the mortgage scheme was simply a way of making local notables participate, albeit in a lesser role, in imperial benevolence. It is possible that the scheme was, to some extent, a forced loan, something that tied unwilling landowners to the imperial treasure in order to make them supply some funds to civic expenses. The same notion of exploiting private, and supposedly more efficient, management of a landed estate as a means to obtain public revenue was also employed by other similar and lesser schemes. The Senator Pliny had endowed his city of Commum a perpetual right to an annual charge of 30,000 sesterti on one of his estates in perpetuity even after his death Pliny's heirs or any subsequent purchaser of the estate being liable, with the rent thus obtained contributing to the maintenance of Pliny. S. Semi private charitable foundation. With such a scheme, Pliny probably hoped to engender enthusiasm among fellow landowners for such philanthropic ventures. Trajan did likewise, but since, willingness is a slippery commodity, Finley suspects that, in order to ensure Italian landowners' acceptance of the burden of borrowing from the Alimenta Fund, some moral Pressure was exerted, in short, the scheme was so limited in scope that it could not have fulfilled a coherent economic or demographic purpose, it was the usual ancient charity, directed, not towards the poor, but to the community in this case, the Italian cities as a whole. The fact that the Alimenta was begun during and after the Dacian Wars and twice came on the heels of a distribution of money to the population of Rome following Dacian triumphs, points towards a purely charitable motive. The fact that the Alimenta was restricted to Italy highlights the ideology behind it, to reaffirm the notion of the Roman Empire as an Italian overlordship. Given its limited scope, the plan was, nevertheless, very successful in that it lasted for a century and a half. The last known official in charge of it is attested during the reign of Aurelian. <laughs> War against Parthia in 113, Trajan embarked on his last campaign, provoked by Parthia's decision to put an unacceptable king on the throne of Armenia, a kingdom over which the two great empires had shared hegemony since the time of Nero some fifty years earlier. It S. Noteworthy, however, that Trajan, already in Syria early in 113, consistently refused to accept diplomatic approaches from the Parthians in order to settle the Armenian imbroglio peacefully, as the surviving literary accounts of Trajan's Parthian war are fragmentary and scattered, it is difficult to assign them a proper context, something that has led to a long-running controversy about its precise happenings and ultimate aims. Many modern historians consider that Trajan S decision to wage war against Parthia might have had economic motives after Trajan's annexation of Arabia he built a new road via Traiana Nova that went from Bostra to Aila on the Red Sea that meant that Carex on the Persian Gulf was the sole remaining western terminus of the Indian trade route outside direct Roman control and such control was important in order to lower import prices and to limit the supposed drain of precious metals created by the deficit in Roman trade with the Far East that Carex traded with the Roman Empire there can be no doubt as its actual connections with merchants from Palmyra during the period are well documented in a contemporary Palmyrene epigraph which tells of various Palmyrene citizens honored for holding office in Carex. Also, Carex's rulers' domains at the time possibly included the Bahrain Islands where a Palmyrene citizen held office, shortly after Trajan's death, as satrap, but then, the appointment was made by a Parthian king of Carex something which offered the possibility of extending Roman hegemony into the Persian Gulf itself. The rationale behind Trajan S campaign, in this case, was one of breaking down a system of Far Eastern trade through small Semitic Arab 
cities under Parthia's control and to put it under Roman control instead. In his Dacian conquests, Trajan had already resorted to Syrian auxiliary units, whose veterans, along with Syrian traders, had an important role in the subsequent colonization of Dacia. He had recruited Palmyrene units into his army, including a camel unit, therefore apparently procuring Palmyrene support to his ultimate goal of annexing Carrax. It has even been ventured that, when earlier in his campaign Trajan annexed Armenia, he was bound to annex the whole of Mesopotamia lest the Parthians interrupt the flux of trade from the Persian Gulf and or foment trouble at the Roman frontier on the Danube. Other historians reject these motives, as the supposed Parthian control. Over the maritime Far Eastern trade route was, at best, conjectural and based on a selective reading of Chinese sources. Trade by land through Parthia seems to have been unhampered by Parthian authorities and left solely to the devices of private enterprise. Commercial activity in 2nd century Mesopotamia seems to have been a general phenomenon, shared by many peoples within and without the Roman Empire, with no sign of a concerted imperial policy towards it. As in the case of the Alimenta, scholars like Moses Finley and Paul Vane have considered the whole idea of a foreign trade policy behind Trajan's war anachronistic. According to them, the sole Roman concern with the Far Eastern luxuries trade, besides collecting toll taxes and customs, was moral and involved frowning upon the softness of luxuries, but no economic policy. In the absence of conclusive evidence, trade between Rome and India might have been far more balanced, in terms of quantities of precious metals exchanged. One of our sources for the notion of the Roman gold drain, Pliny's the Younger's uncle Pliny the Elder, had earlier described the Gangetic Plains as one of the gold sources for the Roman Empire. Accordingly, in his controversial book on the ancient economy, Finlay considers Trajan. S. Badly miscalculated and expensive assault on Parthia, to be an example of the many Roman commercial wars that had in common the fact of existing only in the books of modern historians. The alternative view is to see the campaign as triggered by the lure of territorial annexation and prestige, the sole motive ascribed by Cassius Dio. As far as territorial conquest involved tax collecting, especially of the 25% tax levied on all goods entering the Roman Empire, the Tetarte, one can say that Trajan's Parthian War had an economic motive. Also, there was the propaganda value of an Eastern conquest that would emulate, in Roman fashion, those of Alexander the Great. The fact that emissaries from the Kushan Empire might have attended to the commemorative ceremonies for the Dacian War may have kindled in some Greco-Roman intellectuals like Plutarch, who wrote about only 70,000 Roman soldiers being necessary to a conquest of India, as well as in Trajan's closer associates, speculative dreams about the booty to be obtained by reproducing Macedonian Eastern conquests. There could also be Trajan idea to use an ambitious blueprint of conquests as a way to emphasize quasi-divine status, such as with his cultivated association, in coins and monuments, to Hercules. Also, it is possible that the attachment of Trajan to an expansionist policy was supported by a powerful circle of conservative senators from Hispania committed to a policy of imperial expansion, first among them being the all-powerful Licinius Sura. Alternatively, one can explain the campaign by the fact that, for the Romans, their empire was in principle unlimited, and that Trajan only took advantage of an opportunity to make idea and reality coincide. Finally, there are other modern historians who think that Trajan's original aims were purely military and quite modest, to assure a more defensible eastern frontier for the Roman Empire, crossing northern Mesopotamia along the course of the Khabar River in order to offer cover to a Roman Armenia. This interpretation is backed by the fact that all subsequent Roman wars against Parthia would aim at establishing a Roman presence deep into Parthia itself. The campaign was carefully planned in advance. Ten legions were concentrated in the Eastern Theatre. Since 111, the correspondence of Pliny the Younger witnesses to the fact that provincial authorities in Bithynia had to organize supplies for passing troops, and local city councils and their individual members had to shoulder part of the increased expenses by supplying troops themselves. 
The intended campaign, therefore, was immensely costly from its very beginning. Trajan marched first on Armenia, deposed the Parthian appointed king, who was afterwards murdered while kept in the custody of Roman troops in an unclear incident, later described by Fronto as a breach of Roman good faith, and annexed it to the Roman Empire as a province, receiving in passing the acknowledgement of Roman hegemony by various tribes in the Caucasus and on the eastern coast of the Black Sea, a process that kept him busy until the end of 114. At the same time, a Roman column under the legate Lucius Quietus, an outstanding cavalry general who had signalled himself during the Dacian Wars by commanding a unit from his native Mauritania, crossed the Araxes River from Armenia into Media Atropatine and the land of the Mardians present-day Gilan. It is possible that Quietus' campaign had as its goal the extending of the newer, more defensible Roman border eastwards towards the Caspian Sea and northwards to the foothills of the Caucasus. This newer, more rational frontier, depended, however, on an increased, permanent Roman presence east of the Euphrates. The chronology of subsequent events is uncertain, but it is generally believed that early in 115 Trajan launched a Mesopotamian campaign, marching down towards the Taurus Mountains in order to consolidate territory between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. He placed permanent garrisons along the way to secure the territory. While Trajan moved from west to east, Lucius Quietus moved with his army from the Caspian Sea towards the west, both armies performing a successful pincer movement, whose apparent result was to establish a Roman presence into the Parthian Empire proper, with Trajan taking the northern Mesopotamian cities of Nisibis and Batnae and organizing a province of Mesopotamia, including the Kingdom of Osirhain, where King Abgaros VII submitted to Trajan publicly, as a Roman protectorate. This process seems to have been completed at the beginning of 116, when coins were issued announcing that Armenia and Mesopotamia had been put under the authority of the Roman people. The area between the Khabar River and the mountains around Singara seems to have been considered as the new frontier, and as such received a road surrounded by fortresses. After wintering in Antioch during 115–116 and, according to literary sources, barely escaping from a violent earthquake that claimed the life of one of the consuls, M. Pedo Virgilianus, Trajan again took to the field in 116, with a view to the conquest of the whole of Mesopotamia, an overambitious goal that eventually backfired on the results of his entire campaign. According to some modern historians, the aim of the campaign of 116 was to achieve a preemptive demonstration aiming not toward the conquest of Parthia, but for tighter Roman control over the eastern trade route. However, the overall scarcity of manpower for the Roman military establishment meant that the campaign was doomed from the start. It is noteworthy that no new legions were raised by Trajan before the Parthian campaign, maybe because the sources of new citizen recruits were already over-exploited. As far as the sources allow a description of this campaign, it seems that one Roman division crossed the Tigris into Adiabene, sweeping south and capturing Adenistre, a second followed the river south, capturing Babylon. Trajan himself sailed down the Euphrates from Dura Europis, where a triumphal arch was erected in his honor, through Ozagardana, where he erected a tribunal still to be seen at the time of Julian the Apostate's campaigns in the same area. Having come to the narrow strip of land between the Euphrates and the Tigris, he then dragged his fleet overland into the Tigris, capturing Seleucia and finally the Parthian capital of Cte Siphon. He continued southward to the Persian Gulf, when, after escaping with his fleet a tidal bore on the Tigris, he received the submission of Athambelus, the ruler of Carrax. He declared Babylon a new province of the empire and had his statue erected on the shore of the Persian Gulf, after which he sent the Senate a laureled letter declaring the war to be at a close and bemoaning that he was too old to go on any further and repeat the conquests of Alexander the Great. Since Carrax was a de facto independent kingdom whose connections to Palmyra were described above, Trajan's bid for the Persian Gulf may have coincided with Palmyrene interests in the region. Another hypothesis is that the rulers of Carrax had expansionist designs on Parthian Babylon, giving them a rationale for alliance with Trajan. The Parthian summer capital of Susa was apparently also occupied by the Romans. According to late literary sources, not backed by numismatic or inscriptional evidence, a province of Assyria was also proclaimed, apparently covering the territory of Adiabene. Some measures seem to have been considered regarding the fiscal administration of Indian trade, or simply about the payment of customs portoria on goods traded on the Euphrates and Tigris. It is possible that it was this streamlining 
of the administration of the newly conquered lands according to the standard pattern of Roman provincial administration in tax collecting, requisitions and the handling of local potentates' prerogatives, that triggered later resistance against Trajan. According to some modern historians, Trajan might have busied himself during his stay on the Persian Gulf with ordering raids on the Parthian coasts, as well as probing into extending Roman suzerainty over the mountaineer tribes holding the passes across the Zagros Mountains into the Iranian plateau eastward, as well as establishing some sort of direct contact between Rome and the Kushan Empire. No attempt was made to expand into the Iranian plateau itself, where the Roman army, with its relative weakness in cavalry, would have been at a disadvantage. However, as Trajan left the Persian Gulf for Babylon, where he intended to offer sacrifice to Alexander in the house where he had died in 323 BC, a sudden outburst of Parthian resistance, led by a nephew of the Parthian king Osros I, Sanatruses, occurred. Sanatruses, who had retained a cavalry force, possibly strengthened by the addition of Saka archers, imperiled Roman positions in Mesopotamia and Armenia, something Trajan sought to deal with by forsaking direct Roman rule in Parthia proper, at least partially. Trajan sent two armies towards northern Mesopotamia, the first, under Lucius Quietus, recovered Nisibis and Edessa from the rebels, probably having King Abgarus deposed and killed in the process, with Quietus probably earning the right to receive the honours of a senator of praetorian rank the second army, however, under Appius Maximus Santra probably a governor of Macedonia was defeated and Santra killed. Later in 116, Trajan, with the assistance of Quietus and two other legates, Marcus Arutius Clarus and Tiberius Julius Alexander Julianus, defeated a Parthian army in a battle where Sanatruses was killed possibly with the assistance of Osros, son and Sanatruses, cousin, Parthomaspates, whom Trajan wooed successfully. After retaking and burning Seleucia, Trajan then formally deposed the Osros, putting Parthomaspates on the throne as client ruler. This event was commemorated in a coin so as to be presented as the reduction of Parthia to client kingdom status, Rex Parthisdatus, a king is given to the Parthians. That done, Trajan retreated north in order to retain what he could of the new provinces of Armenia, where he had already accepted an armistice in exchange for surrendering part of the territory to Sanatrus's son Vologizes, and Mesopotamia. It was at this point that Trajan's health started to fail him. The fortress city of Hatra, on the Tigris in his rear, continued to hold out against repeated Roman assaults. He was personally present at the siege, and it is possible that he suffered a heat stroke while in the blazing heat. Shortly afterwards, the Jews inside the Eastern Roman Empire, in Egypt, Cyprus, and Cyrene, this last province being probably the original trouble hotspot, rose up in what probably was an outburst of religious rebellion against the local pagans, this widespread rebellion being afterwards named the Quito's War. Another rebellion flared up among the Jewish communities of northern Mesopotamia, probably part of a general reaction against Roman occupation. Trajan was forced to withdraw his army in order to put down the revolts. He saw this withdrawal as simply a temporary setback, but he was destined never to command an army in the field again, turning his eastern armies over to Lucius Quietus, who meanwhile early 117 had been made governor of Judea and might have had to deal earlier with some kind of Jewish unrest in the province. Quietus discharged his commissions successfully, so much that the war was afterward named after him, Quietus being a corruption of Quietus. Whether or not the Quito's war theater included Judea proper, or only the Jewish Eastern diaspora, remains doubtful in the absence of clear epigraphic and archaeological evidence. What is certain is that there was an increased Roman military presence in Judea at the time. Quietus was promised a consulate in the following year 118 for his victories, but he was killed before this could occur, during the bloody purge that opened Hadrian. S. Reign, in which Quietus and three other former consuls were sentenced to death after being tried on a vague charge of conspiracy by the secret court of the Praetorian prefect Atianus. It has been theorized that Quietus and his colleagues were executed on Hadrian's direct orders, for fear of their popular standing with the army and their close connections to Trajan. In contrast, the next prominent Roman figure in charge of the repression of the Jewish revolt, the equestrian Quintus Marcius Turbo, who had dealt with the rebel leader from Cyrene, Lucuas, retained Hadrian's 
S. Trust, eventually becoming his Praetorian prefect. Apparently, Hadrian could not allow the continued existence alongside him of a group of independent-minded senatorial generals inherited from his predecessor. As all four consulars were senators of the highest standing and as such generally regarded as able to take imperial power Hadrian seems to have decided on a preemptive strike against these prospective rivals. <laughs> Death and succession Early in 117, Trajan grew ill and set out to sail back to Italy. His health declined throughout the spring and summer of 117, something publicly acknowledged by the fact that a bronze bust displayed at the time in the public baths of Ancyra showed him clearly aged and emaciated. After reaching Salinas modern in Cilicia, which was afterwards called Trajanopolis, he suddenly died from edema on August 8. Some say that Trajan had adopted Hadrian as his successor, but others that it was his wife Pompeia Platina who assured the succession to Hadrian by keeping his death secret and afterwards hiring someone to impersonate Trajan by speaking with a tired voice behind a curtain, well after Trajan had died. Dio, who tells this narrative, offers his father, the then governor of Cilicia Apronianus, as a source, and therefore his narrative is possibly grounded on contemporary rumor. It may also originate in Roman displeasure at an empress meddling in political affairs. He had reigned for 19 years, longer than anyone since Tiberius, which was broken by Hadrian. Hadrian held an ambiguous position during Trajan's reign. After commanding Legio I Minervia during the Dacian Wars, he had been relieved from frontline duties at the decisive stage of the Second Dacian War, being sent to govern the newly created province of Pannonia Inferior. He had pursued a senatorial career without particular distinction and had not been officially adopted by Trajan although he received from him decorations and other marks of distinction that made him hope for the succession. He received no post after his 108 consulate, and no further honours other than being made archon eponymas for Athens in 111-112s. He probably did not take part in the Parthian War. Literary sources relate that Trajan had considered others, such as the jurist Lucius Nerasius Priscus, as heir. However, Hadrian, who was eventually entrusted with the governorship of Syria at the time of Trajan's death, was Trajan's cousin and was married to Trajan's grandniece, which all made him as good as heir designate. In addition Hadrian was born in Hispania and seems to have been well connected with the powerful group of Spanish senators influential at Trajan's court through his ties to Platina and the prefect Atianus. The fact that during Hadrian's reign he did not pursue Trajan's senatorial policy may account for the crass hostility shown him by literary sources, aware that the Parthian campaign was an enormous setback, and that it revealed that the Roman Empire had no means for an ambitious program of conquests. Hadrian's first act as emperor was to abandon, outwardly out of his own free will, the distant and indefensible Mesopotamia and to restore Armenia, as well as Osirhane, to the Parthian hegemony under Roman suzerainty. However, all the other territories conquered by Trajan were retained. Roman friendship ties with Carrix also known by the name of Messene were also retained although it is debated whether this had to do more with trade concessions than with common Roman policy of exploiting dissensions amid the empire's neighbors. Trajan's ashes were laid to rest underneath Trajan's column, the monument commemorating his success. Topic: <laughs> Building activities. Topic Trajan was a prolific builder in Rome and the provinces, and many of his buildings were erected by the gifted architect Apollodorus of Damascus. Notable structures include the Baths of Trajan, Trajan's Forum, Trajan, South Column, Trajan's Bridge, Alcantara Bridge, Porto di Traiano of Portus, the road and canal around the Iron Gates, see Conquest of Dacia, and possibly the Alcanatar Bridge. Some historians also attribute the construction of the Babylon fortress in Egypt to Trajan. The remains of the fort is what is now known as the Church of Mar Gurgis and its surrounding buildings. In order to build his forum and the adjacent brick market that also held his name, Trajan had vast areas of the surrounding Capitoline and Quirinal hills leveled. Topic: <laughs> Trajan's legacy. Topic: 
Unlike many lauded rulers in history, Trajan's reputation has survived undiminished for nearly 19 centuries. Ancient sources on Trajan's personality and accomplishments are unanimously positive. Pliny the Younger, for example, celebrates Trajan in his panegyric as a wise and just emperor and a moral man. Cassius Dio added that he always remained dignified and fair. A 3rd century emperor, Decius, even received from the Senate the name Trajan as a decoration. After the setbacks of the 3rd century, Trajan, together with Augustus, became in the later Roman Empire the paragon of the most positive traits of the imperial order. At the inauguration of later Roman emperors, the Senate would say the phrase Felicior Augusto, Melior Traiano, be more fortunate than Augustus and better than Trajan. The Christianization of Rome resulted in further embellishment of his legend. It was commonly said in medieval times that Pope Gregory I, through divine intercession, resurrected Trajan from the dead and baptized him into the Christian faith. An account of this features in the Golden Legend. Some theologians, such as Thomas Aquinas, discussed Trajan as an example of a virtuous pagan. In the Divine Comedy, Dante, following this legend, sees the spirit of Trajan in the heaven of Jupiter with other historical and mythological persons noted for their justice. Also, a mural of Trajan stopping to provide justice for a poor widow is present in the first terrace of Purgatory as a lesson to those who are purged for being proud. He also features in Piers Plowman. An episode referred to as the Justice of Trajan was reflected in several art works. In the 18th century, King Charles III of Spain commissioned Anton Rafael Mengs to paint the Triumph of Trajan on the ceiling of the Banquet Hall of the Royal Palace of Madrid. Considered among the best works of this artist, it was only during the Enlightenment that this legacy began to be contested, when Edward Gibbon expressed doubts about the militarized character of Trajan's reign in contrast to the moderate practices of his immediate successors. Momsen adopted a divided stance towards Trajan, at some point of his posthumously published lectures even speaking about his vainglory shineglory. Momsen also speaks of Trajan's insatiable, unlimited lust for conquest. Although Momsen had no liking for Trajan, S successor Hadrian a repellent manner, and a venomous, envious and malicious nature he admitted that Hadrian, in renouncing Trajan, S conquests, was, "...doing what the situation clearly required." It was exactly this military character of Trajan's reign that attracted his early 20th-century biographer, the Italian fascist historian Roberto Parabeni, who in his 1927 two-volume biography Optimus Princeps described Trajan's reign as the acme of the Roman Principate, which he saw as Italy's patrimony. Following in Parabeni S footsteps, the German historian Alfred Hughes saw in Trajan the accomplished human embodiment of the imperial title die ideale ver corporing de human encaserbegriffs. Trajan's first English-language biography by Julian Bennett is also a positive one in that it assumes that Trajan was an active policy maker concerned with the management of the empire as a whole, something his reviewer Lendon considers an anachronistic outlook that sees in the Roman emperor a kind of modern administrator. During the 1980s, the Romanian historian Eugen Chizek took a more nuanced view as he described the changes in the personal ideology of Trajan. S reign, stressing the fact that it became ever more autocratic and militarized, especially after 112 and towards the Parthian War as only an universal monarch, a cosmocrator, could dictate his law to the East. The biography by the German historian Karl Strobel stresses the continuity between Domitian's and Trajan's reigns, saying that Trajan's rule followed the same autocratic and sacred character as Domitian. S, culminating in a failed Parthian adventure intended as the crown of his personal achievement. It is in modern French historiography that Trajan's reputation becomes most markedly deflated. Paul Petit writes about Trajan's portraits as a lowbrow boor with a taste for booze and boys. For Paul Vane, what is to be retained from Trajan's stylish? Qualities was that he was the last Roman emperor to think of the empire as a purely Italian and Rome-centered hegemony of conquest. In contrast, his successor Hadrian would stress the notion of the empire as ecumenical and of the emperor as universal benefactor and not cosmocrator. Notes <laughs> 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 
Topic: References and further reading. Topic: Alighieri, Dante, 1998, First Pub, 1993, The Divine Comedy, translated by Sisson, Charles H. Oxford, Oxford University Press. ISBN 978-0-19-283502-4. Alston, Richard Aspects of Roman History 31 BCAD 117. Abingdon, Routledge. ISBN 978-0-415-61120-6. In Cell, R. Manning. Soldiers. Military Heritage. December 2001. Volume 3, No. 312, 14, 16, 20. Trajan, Emperor of Rome. Bennett, Julian. 2001. Trajan. Optimus Princeps. Bloomington, Indiana University Press. ISBN 978 0 253 21435 5. Burley, Anthony R. 2013. Hadrian, The Restless Emperor. Abingdon, Routledge. ISBN 978 0 415 16544 0. In French, Des Bosc's Plateau, Francoise. Un Parti Hispanique à Rome, Ascension des élites hispaniques et pouvoir politique d'Auguste à Hadrian, 27 Avenue. J. C. 138 App. J. C. Madrid, Casa de Velázquez. ISBN 978 84 95555 8 0 9. Boersic, G. W. Roman Arabia, Harvard University Press, 1983. In French, Choisnel, Emmanuel. 2004. Les Parths et la route de la Soie, Paris, Larmatin. ISBN 978 2 7475 7037 4. In French, Crystal, M., Noni, N. 2003. Rome et Sun Empire. Paris, Hachette. ISBN 978 2 01 145542 0. In French, Chizek, Eugen. L'époque de Trajan, sur Constances politiques et problèmes idéologiques. Bucharest, Editora Scientifica C. Encyclopedica, 1983, ISBN 978-2-251-32852-2. Dando Collins, Stephen. Legions of Rome, The Definitive History of Every Roman Legion. London, Quercus. ISBN 978-1-84916-230-2. Edwell, Peter. 2007. Between Rome and Persia: The Middle Euphrates, Mesopotamia, and Palmyra under Roman control. Abingdon, Routledge. ISBN 978-0-203-93833-1. Finley, M. I. The Ancient Economy. Berkeley, University of California Press. ISBN 978-0-520-21946-5. Fuller, J.F.C. A Military History of the Western World. Three volumes. New York, Da Capo Press, Inc., 1987 and 1988. V. 1. From the Late Times to the Battle of Lepanto, ISBN 0-306-80304-6, 255, 266, 269, 270, 273 Trajan, Roman Emperor. Garzetti, Albino from Tiberius to the Antonines, A History of the Roman Empire AD 14–192. Abingdon, Routledge. ISBN 978-1-138-01920-1. Gazdak, Christian Monetary Circulation in Dacia and the Provinces from the Middle and Lower Danube from Trajan to Constantine I AD 106–337. Cluj-Napoca, Mega. ISBN 978-606-543-040-2. Granger, John D. 2004. Nerva and the Roman Succession Crisis of AD 96–99. Abingdon, Routledge. ISBN 978-0-415-34958-1. Isaac, B. The Limits of Empire, The Roman Army in the East, Revised Edition, Oxford University Press, 1990 ISBN 0-19-814891-7-0-CLC-2009-1873 Kennedy, D. The Roman Army in Jordan, Revised Edition, Council for British Research in the Levant, 2004. 
ISBN 0 9539102 1 00CLC 59267318. Kettenhofen, Eric. Trajan. Encyclopedia Iranica, Jones, Brian. The Emperor Domitian. London, Routledge. ISBN 978 0 203 03625 9. Leper, F. A. Trajan's Parthian War. London, Oxford University Press, 1948. OCLC 2898605 also available online. Lutwak, Edward N. The Grand Strategy of the Roman Empire, from the 1st century AD to the 3rd. Baltimore, Johns Hopkins University Press. ISBN 978-0-8018-2158-5. Mattern, Susan P. Rome and the Enemy, Imperial Strategy in the Principate. Berkeley, University of California Press. ISBN 978-0-520-21166-7. Momsen, Theodore A History of Rome under the Emperors. London, Routledge. ISBN 978-0-203-97908-2. In French, Minot, Gérard, Les Vies de Twelve Femmes d'Empereur Romain, Devoir, Intrigues and Voluptes, Paris, Larmatin, 2012, ch. 6. La vie de Platine, Femme de Trajan, p. 147–168. ISBN 978-2-336-00291-0. Petit, Paul Pax Romana. Berkeley, University of California Press. ISBN 978-0-520-02171-6. Rees, Roger Latin Panegyric. Oxford, Oxford University Press. ISBN 978-0-19-957671-5, in French La Rue, Patrick La Hot Empire Romain and Occident, d'Auguste aux Severs. Paris, Sewell. ISBN 978-2-02-025932-3, de Ste, Croy, Gem The Class Struggle in the Ancient Greek World. London, Duckworth. ISBN 978-0-8014-9597-7, in Spanish Sartre, Maurice 1994. El Oriente Romano, Party 3. Madrid, Acal. ISBN 978-84-460-0412-7. Schmitz, Michael The Dacian Threat, 101–106 AD. Armadale, Australia, Caros Tai. ISBN 978-0-9758445-0-2. Sidebotham, Stephen E. Roman Economic Policy in the Erythra Thalassa, 30 BC AD 217. Leiden, Brill. ISBN 978-90-04-07644-0, in German Strobel, Karl Kaiser Tryon, Eine Epoche der Weltgeschichte. Regensburg, F. Pustet. ISBN 978-3-7917-2172-9, in French Vain, Paul Le Pan et le Cirque, Paris, Sewell. ISBN 978-2-02-004507-0, in French Vain, Paul La Société Romaine, Paris, Sewell. ISBN 978-2-02-052360-8, in French Vain, Paul L'Empire Greco-Roman. Paris, Sewell. ISBN 978-2-02-057798-4. Young, Gary K. Rome's Eastern Trade, International Commerce and Imperial Policy 31 BC, AD 305. Abingdon, Routledge. ISBN 978-0-203-47093-0. Wildfuer, C. R. H. Trajan, Lion of Rome, The Untold Story of Rome's Greatest Emperor, Aquifer Publishing, 2009. ISBN 0-9818460-6-8 OCLC 4960047788 Historical Fiction Topic primary source topic Cassius Dio, Roman History Book 68, English translation Aurelius Victor a trib, Epitome de Caesaribus Chapter 13, English translation Pliny the Younger, Letters, Book 10, English translation topic Secondary material topic Benario, Herbert W. 2000. 
Trajan AD 98-117. De Imperatoribus Romanus. Retrieved September 24, 2007. Topic: External links. Topic: 